Today, I would like to, to talk to you about, uh, uh, indeed, about the diffusion NMR and uh, give you a few examples how uh, diffusion NMR can be successfully combined with the scattering methods and also with another methods. Um, content of, of my talk is, uh, first, I will explain shortly what is an NMR, uh, because I think auditorium uh, knows, uh, knows, have a knowledge about NMR technique. Uh, then I uh, dwell on gradient methods, uh, mention equipment, and tell you about the synergy of quens and pulse field gradient NMR, uh, uh, and present a few examples, in particular, how we measure the diffusion of polymers in melting solutions, diffusion of proteins in complex environment. Uh, in particular, here, uh, I will mention a monoclonal antibody study. And the last example will be the translocation of alternating um, Philip polymers through the lipid membrane. Uh, yeah, principle of uh, NMR techniques, uh, uh, NMR techniques are, are quite simple. Uh, here uh, in my talk, I mean, uh, so I will only mention uh, proton spins. When I mention spin, I mean proton spin because uh, it's only technique we applied, and that's only example that I have for a moment. So. The point is uh, the proton spin is placed uh, on in the mag magnetic field, uh, B0. Uh, 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 each spin has a nuclear hair magnetic ratio, and therefore it starts to process uh, around the magnetic field with um, Larmor frequency. And from this, uh, we can say that uh, system uh, gets uh, magnetization that you can be manipulated. Uh, we manipulate uh, with the ma uh, magnetic moment of the system, uh, total magnetic moment, uh, applying the sequence of radio frequency pulses. Uh, in particular, here, uh, the very uh, simple uh, sequence um, applied, that's only 19 degree pulse. After pulse or seri series of pulses, you get a response of spin system. And uh, you can measure amplitude and phase of total magnetization. Uh, doing this, uh, the details of molecular structure and mobility uh, can be determined uh, uh, by response of spin system. So uh, next, so chemical shift. As I mentioned already, if you apply a 90 degree um, radio frequency pulse, mm, this um, Pulse uh, um, uh, leads to uh, free induction decay. Uh, that's a uh, that's a common name for this um, effect. Uh, in particular, uh, in here on the left side, so you can see the spectrum, NMR spectrum of uh, these n propyl acetate molecules, uh, where uh, uh, different uh, hydrogens uh, exist and. Uh, uh, Hydrogen has a different surrounding. It's surrounded by different molecules, and therefore it uh, uh, gets the difficult, uh, the different uh, chemical shifts. And these chemical shifts uh, uh, can be measured. Uh, interpretation uh, of these frequencies, or they measured frequently in ppm, not only in hertz, uh, you can get information about molecular structure. Uh, here, I would like to mention that the resolution uh, can be different uh, for different spectrometers. Uh, when you have a, a higher um, frequency of your spectrometers, then, uh, of course, your resolution will be better. And then you can just separate a uh, very detailed um, structure of your spin system. <clears throat> Further. So you can get the chemical shift, uh, but uh, it's not only uh, what we would like to measure. We would like to measure the dynamics. <clears throat> uh, and here I will talk about NMR Han echo uh, that uh, uh, can be compared uh, with the neutron spin echo, uh, spin echo later, neutron spin echo later. So. Uh, what we get after first pulse that I mentioned already, uh, we uh, uh, can observe that NMR signal decays after the first pulse. Uh, there are there can be uh, a number of reasons for that. Uh, for example, uh, spin relaxation. 
uh, that is uh, proportional to the um, so-called relaxation uh, T T2 relaxation time. It's irreversible loss of magnetization. And uh, another effect can be different types of field <laughs> inhomogeneities. Uh, how to struggle with these effects? Uh, you can simply uh, get uh, apply the 180 degree pulse, uh, where all these inhomogeneities that actually deface your system can be rephased again. So uh, this refocusing of spin magnetization can be reached by 180 inversion pulse, and you can get kind of uh, Han echo um, at the typical time when you wait uh, two times T after first pulse. So uh, variation uh, with this already, you can measure the diffusion effect, effects, kind of diffusion effects, but uh, these diffusion effects uh, can be related to uh, different nuclear mobilities in your systems. So therefore, uh, often uh, this system is not applied. In uh, this uh, sequence is not applied. Uh, typically, a uh, variation of this uh, relaxation time uh, can uh, give you the diff uh, can lead to the decrease of the echo uh, amplitude. So how it looks like uh, in terms of magnetic field. So uh, here you can see that uh, you have a X, Y, Z, and you can see that in terms of magnetic field, your magnetic field is homogeneous. So you uh, have no any uh, local uh, um, local inhomogeneities in, in your magnetic field. So, but uh, later came the idea that why uh, we don't do don't do don't do this systematically. So, for example, we create in each uh, point of the space. So, we will create the um, specific additional magnetic field. So, by doing uh, this by by using gradients. So for example, here, if you uh, apply the gradient along the z-axis and uh, you multiply by position along the z-axis, uh, you would get then additional magnetic field that would be different in each uh, point of your space. So by this way, you can just kind of label your space and measure the, um, and make the inhomogeneity uh, uh, you can control this in homogeneity, and with this, you can get this mean square displacement uh, as a function of uh, time, for example. So here, uh, you can see how it can be organized uh, along the one axis. Uh, this, in particular, I will mention later. Uh, here, you can see that the echo depends already on the position. Uh, this uh, complex radio frequency signal uh, can be analyzed, and from this uh, you can get this um, uh, attenuation uh, decay of your echo, and from this you can get the parameter of your diffusion process. So one can also apply for uh, this gradient uh, along the two axes, uh, for example, e e x and y axis. Uh, and then uh, manipulating with this radio frequency signal, so phasing, dephasing of them, uh, you can get the echo that depends already uh, on the position in 2D space. So this goes in the direction, into direction the magnetic resonance imaging, so to say, uh, that is applied uh, with um, uh, magnet magnetic resonance tomography. <clears throat> Uh, but we do uh, uh, more simple uh, things. So in particular, we measure the chemical shift. <clears throat> uh, we get the chemical shift in the system and we uh, apply the magnetic field uh, gradient. And with this, uh, you observe that uh, as uh, longer your pulse is, and then uh, that means that the uh, more uh, inhomogeneous field uh, you create, and with this, you can measure the uh, longer uh, displacement of your spins. So uh, here you can see that decay, uh, so the amplitude of the signal of chemical shift it decays, and uh, you can get uh, NMR signal amplitude, so called, uh, as a function of this uh, uh, specific parameter that is 
uh, proportional to the gradient. So one can compare this parameter with a, a momentum transfer uh, that we uh, also get uh, for quens, uh, quasi elastic neutron scattering that I described a little bit later. Uh, the parameter that is fixed for each diffusion NMR experiment is the diffusion time, that's uh, distance between these gradient pulses. So with this, you fix your measurement time. And if uh, only one diffusion process in your system uh, takes place, so then uh, using this simple equation, uh, equation, you can get the cell diffusion coefficient from this uh, equation. So how it's related to the quasi-elastic neutron scattering, uh, uh, this similar to backscattering and time of flight, uh, we measure uh, with the PFG NMR, one can measure in coherent correlation function. So, but on the time and length scale, <clears throat> uh, with the big scale in time of flight, we are somewhere here from one to, to, uh, to 100 angstrom. Uh, and uh, from picoseconds to uh, effectively uh, a few nanoseconds. I don't know why it's been so long, but okay. <clears throat> and here you can see the um, example of the spectra. So here uh, I wanted to say that uh, backscattering has a, a high resolution, uh, but uh, more limited energy range where you can measure your dynamics. And time of flight, it has a broader range, but range, uh, but um, a worse resolution. So you can combine both this method, and in particular. Um, here, I would like to address to the um, uh, talk of Ralph Bill, who presented this method already. Uh, we have a high resolution quens. Uh, it falls in neutron spin echo spectroscopy uh, that probes uh, the chain, chain dynamic, uh, probes the whatever dynamics on nanometer scale. Um, and the times uh, in the time range from one to 1,000 nanoseconds. Um, uh, Advantage of neutron scattering, uh, we can measure in a quite broad range of uh, momentum transfer from 0.02 to 0.2, so that's uh, one order of magnitude. Uh, that means that we can compare, uh, we are in small angle region. Um, the method requires contrast, I mean, and neutron spin echo, uh, where you, um, for example, uh, you have to have a 10% of the genetic polymer and deuterated matrix. Uh, with this method, we uh, measure coherent structure factor uh, that can be also um, uh, compared with the collective diffusion measured by dynamic light scattering, but at essentially lower uh, momentum transfer range. As an example, uh, for example, for polymer chains, we can measure uh, dynamics from the, uh, yeah, so we can measure different types of effects starting from relaxation rate, uh, elementary route relaxation range uh, rate. Uh, we can measure spectral relaxation times of the polymer chain, and we can measure also confinement lengths uh, that appears for very long polymer chains. Um, at longer uh, times and uh, shorter momentum transfer. So uh, what is the synergy? As I said already, uh, uh, with the neutrons, we measure incoherent structure factor and we measure uh, mean square displacement. Uh, and with PFG and R, we measure thickened diffusion on the time scale uh, uh, larger than 20 milliseconds. And on the length scale, uh, from 10 power 2 to 12. So we measure this range. And we can also uh, get the advantage uh, of, so we uh, uh, will, we are also able to measure um, so-called uh, momentum transfer, but in presentation of PFG and MR. Uh, about equipment. So what which equipment can we use? Um, so for uh, high resolution NMR, uh, we use a high um, um, we, we use a magnet, a superconductive magnet with a high frequency. And with this you can just measure this chemical shift. Um, 
As an example, uh, here you can see the 600 megahertz spectrometer uh, that uh, provides with the field gradients up to 30 tesla per meter. That means that uh, the diffusion coefficient that is actually available is um, varies in very broad range from 10 minus 10, 9 uh, to 10 minus 15 meters square per second. But there is another option that we also often use, in particular for polymer melts. It's a very small uh, benchtop instrument with a, a quite low um, uh, resonance frequency. Um, it has no high resolution NMR, so that means that you are not able to measure chemical shift. You measure everything, uh, all the uh, diffusion of all protons. Uh, there is no selectivity with the quite low gradient, but also with this instrument, uh, uh, the quite broad range of diffusion coefficients is available. So samples uh, that are typically used because uh, it's often that uh, that for scientists is important how much sample uh, we can we need for the one measurement. So that's 0 0.6 to one milliliter of the sample with the proton uh, content is about one percent. So that's a standard. Yeah, so NMR tubes that are actually available. Uh, but sometimes uh, some additional treatment of the samples uh, is necessary because uh, sometimes so particular polymer samples, they are they tend to do some strange things and you need uh, some centrifugation and so on. So uh, now I would like to address a uh, uh, first example uh, about the polymer dynamics. Uh, it's uh, related to the linear chains that, that are typically interpenetrate strongly and entangled. And for these polymer chains, there is a, uh, there are two, two types of theories. Uh, first, it's um, for non-entangled uh, polymer melt, uh, the Rouse model is typically used. Uh, and for entanglement, uh, entangled melts, so uh, there is a heuristic micros microscopic model, uh, so-called uh, rotation tube model, uh, that provides us with um, um, a few very important parameters, for example, tube diameter, uh, tube step lengths, and contour lengths. So that means that uh, polymer chains they are confined, and you can, uh, by our methods, you can you can try to get uh, these confinement lengths and another characteristics, for example, relaxation times and elementary relaxation time of polymer segment. So. And uh, for a long time, uh, that tube concept uh, was treated uh, uh, by the way that the Rouse dynamics on the scale uh, below the entangled distance uh, should be um, so uh, on the scale on, below of the entangled distance, uh, the dynamics uh, is controlled by Rouse theory. And uh, what would be the concept for weakly entangled chain? So where you don't have so much uh, entanglements in your system. <clears throat> this we were able uh, to measure, we, this we were able to measure with neutron spin echo. Uh, what you measure with neutron spin echo, you measure this rel uh, relaxation uh, decays of your uh, uh, structure factor, and you uh, get the dynamic structure factor as a function of temperature, as a function of moment momentum transfer, um, actually, for uh, this weakly entangled polymer chain, uh, we have uh, two uh, terms uh, for our dynamic structure factor. It's a uh, center of mass uh, uh, diffusion and internal Rouse dynamics that includes also important parameter, uh, a segmental relaxation rate. It's a relaxation rate of single segment. Um, here, I, I, I will talk about this, um, uh, about the region when um, Rouse dynamics, uh, this Rouse term is about one uh, that we observe for a uh, relatively low Q uh, range, um, where uh, all, um, yeah, so the, when the um, internal modes of the polymer chains, they are not so important already, and we can study the center of mass diffusion. That's exactly where uh, PFG and MR uh, could be useful uh, because it gives the uh, translational diffusion coefficient at the time scale of 100 milliseconds. That means that 
you measure really a center of mass diffusion. Um, here we measure the center of mass diffusion as a function of temperature. Uh, and if you apply Arrhenius law to this dependence, you can get the activation energy uh, of order of 22 kilojoule per mole. Um, that can be actually related to the uh, neutron spin. Uh, neutron, uh, um, yeah, so uh, that you, you can actually compare to the segmental with the segmental relaxation rate obtained uh, with the neutron scattering methods. Uh, by this way, uh, we were able to uh, conclude that the cell diffusion on the millisecond time scale relate to the local segmental dynamics because uh, when we compared this uh, activation energy, they uh, resulted in the same values. So uh, uh, with uh, re related uh, re uh, in regard to center of mass diffusion, uh, we were able to get a few interesting results uh, for this weakly entangled chains. Uh, we were able to get the crossover uh, from subdiffusion to thickened diffusion. For this, you have to have a knowledge uh, of the diffusion coefficient that we measure with PFG and MR. And uh, we were able to get the details of this crossover, for example, time uh, and uh, distance where this crossover happens. And uh, it turned out that the uh, distance is about uh, uh, this confinement length, length of the uh, um, and tube diameter. Uh, and the times uh, where this crossover happens, uh, they are relatively larger, uh, much larger than uh, maximum uh, realization time of uh, arouse time of polymer chain, terminal time of polymer chain. Um, yeah, so I would uh, conclude here that uh, in principle, so uh, PFGNMR is quite effective. Uh, in particular, for the polymer melts, we were able to measure the peak in diffusion as a function of temperature, uh, relate this to the center of mass diffusion and Rouse dynamics uh, obtained by NSA. Uh, and we were able to derive the details of subdiffusion behavior uh, of weakly entangled chain with by doing this. So now the uh, example two. Uh, here I, sorry. Uh, here I would like to dwell on the polyelectrolyte dynamics in solution. Uh, that was a very simple example of polystyrene sulfonic acid, uh, where we uh, measure the the dynamics in. Uh, in uh, dif uh, different salt concentration, sodium fluoride concentration. Uh, in this system, we typically have uh, uh, two types of counter ions, uh, H plus, uh, H plus and sodium. Uh, samples were dialyzed and effective charge was about 8%. Um, we started first the structure with uh, X-ray spectroscopy uh, and we saw that the as predicted, and it was already known, uh, structure depends on the salt uh, on the salt concentration. So that was everything what we could imagine. Uh, the uh, diffusion measured uh, was measured by DLS first, uh, where we just see that the collective collective diffusion increases uh, with the concentration of the polymer, uh, but for PFGNMR cell diffusion, we saw that diffusion uh, decreases uh, with the polymer concentration. Uh, here we use an intermediate molecular weight uh, polyelectrolyte. And uh, uh, the most interesting uh, is that when we uh, measured uh, PFGNMR at very low concentration, uh, we were able to get this uh, interesting result. Uh, where we saw the dependence on the ion uh, of the salt concentration, actually at the constant uh, polymer concentration, that led us to, to the conclusion that we really observe here the conformation change between uh, uh, a spherical, uh, between coil like polymer chain and uh, stretched conformation. So then uh, we uh, measured uh, the very large. Uh, uh, chains uh, at very low concentration, 
uh, that was actually uh, less than overlap concentration. And we saw that the here uh, we have a, a nice, nice um, uh, coincidence of the diffusion coefficient measured by DLS. Uh, here I'm talking about fast component. Uh, there is also a sl uh, slow component uh, that is typically rela uh, related to some other effects. Uh, and PFG and MR, they uh, at high salt concentration, they actually coincide with each other. So that we found uh, really uh, good uh, just to prove uh, the, our concept so that we uh, can get the very nice data from both methods. Um, yeah, so with NSA, as uh, uh, was presented by Ralph uh, um, in February, so we can measure the dynamics on the time scale up to 100 nanoseconds. And here uh, you can also compare this with dynamic light scattering. So that I find also very nice. Uh, this, this is data for high salt concentration where uh, we do expect uh, the uh, polymer coil conformation. Uh, the data are nice, but it's difficult to understand this data, what is happening there. Uh, first, we plotted the effective diffusion uh, as a function of uh, momentum transfer. Uh, here, uh, we found that collective diffusion obtained by DLS is very much different from cell diffusion that was measured by PFG and MR. Um, in addition, we took into account the hydrodynamic interactions, uh, uh, applying this uh, um, approximation of the hydro hydrodynamical interaction uh, as a sphere. Um, with a determined radius, uh, uh, and we um, actually um, divided out these hydrodyna hydrodynamic interactions. Um, yeah, to investigate the segmental dynamics in the intermediate Q range, uh, we applied SIM model, uh, where we found that the cell diffusion uh, actually fits very nicely to this segmental zinc dynamics. So it's in fact, give the same results here. Um, and, and fixing this um, segment dynamics, we were able to um, um, make the conclusions that in addition to the segmental dynamics, uh, there is uh, also internal friction in these systems. Uh, that is typical for um, uh, internally. Um, this is typical for EDP and also for poly electrolytes uh, and uh, was ad uh, addressed to the internal friction effect. So this internal friction we were able uh, to extract from this experiment. So summary here. Um, is that uh, pulse cell gradient NMR and scattering methods are really complementary uh, and reflects polyectrolyte chain, chain dynamics. Uh, we also found that internal friction increases with salt concentration. And uh, what I didn't mention that uh, actually that's related to the uh, ion condensation uh, that happens on the um, uh, backbone of polymer chain. Now, further example, um, um, here I would like to address diffusion of proteins and complex environment. Uh, with the complex environment, uh, we um, understand uh, the uh, kind of um, um, polymers or polymer mesh or just highly concentrated proteins like uh, monoclonal antibody that I mentioned later. So uh, we started from uh, diffusion of simple protein, uh, like uh, lactalbumin, just to, just to prove the concept that we can uh, measure some effects here. Uh, this is a 1D spectra, proton spectra of uh, lactalbumin in deteriorated water. Uh, here, um, yeah, so we applied, um, the, uh, we measured this with PFG NMR technique, as I described before. And we obtained a nice uh, straight line. 
from which we can get the diffusion coefficient and uh, depending on the parameters uh, concentration of the um, in this case polymer uh, temperature and buffer uh, we can select selectively measure protein diffusion and uh, if you deteriorate the buffer and other crowded agents uh, you can selectively measure the your protein diffusion so here we did uh, these measurements yeah so how you can see here uh, uh, that's uh, uh, in percent it's a polyethylene oxide concentration uh, that's a polymer concentration uh, in solution um, so one can imagine that if you increase the uh, content of the polymer so the mesh size becomes smaller and the diffusion coefficient uh, should uh, become slower that we actually observe yeah and here uh, I present the uh, results uh, of NSA so this is the red points and the results of pure genome R that's uh, uh, black points so you see that for NSA we have only three points because it's uh, more time consuming that than PF genome R so with PF genome R you can just uh, measure a little bit more points uh, but the most important thing here is uh, diffusion measured by PFG and MR is systematically slower and moreover it demonstrates the kind of um, transition from uh, low uh, 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 from the larger mesh size to the smaller mesh size I would say it like this so uh, the effect we address the diffusion uh, to the difference in the diffusion uh, at short times that we typically measure by in NSA and the large scale diffusion that is measured by PFG and MR so uh, the data they are still uh, under consideration and here I just wanted to present to you this interesting effects that you can measure uh, the next uh, um, example is a diffusion again about the complex environment so that's uh, about diffusion of proteins uh, myelin based proteins in uh, again is a buffer with polyethylene oxide the aim of these measurements uh, was uh, just to observe the aggregation of proteins with polymers in droplets. Uh, the idea was to measure the diffusion uh, of polyethylene oxide and detect uh, slow diffusion components. Uh, and with this, we would like to understand whether polyethylene oxide uh, is present in the droplets uh, with the prote um, million based based proteins. So that's a million based proteins. So that's in particular um, a very important for brain. So here uh, I present the uh, preliminary how the spectrum uh, is um, looks like. So one can see that the um, signal from MVP is typically very low compared to the polyethylene oxide. Uh, that happens due to the additional uh, relaxation effects uh, the uh, proteins uh, they are uh, very close to each other and therefore the protons they um, just relax uh, very fast and therefore the signal uh, may be uh, 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 one can lose the signal due to the uh, this relaxation effects so that's a uh, uh, magnified signal um since we uh, uh, know that MVP signal is quite slow we decided to measure polyethylene oxide and there we detected actually two uh, components so in the droplets here you can see how it looks like uh, for the polyethylene oxide uh, in the droplet and here is a free polyethylene oxide you see that the uh, this slow component for free polyethylene oxide is missing yeah so in uh, quantitative quantitatively uh, we were able to estimate the diffusion cell diffusion coefficient in of the polyethylene oxide in the droplet uh, that is less than 7.7 10 minus 14 meter quadrat per second 
uh, that is we in this case in this specific case so we cannot measure more exact because we uh, we were limited with the gradient so uh, in principle uh, if uh, uh, there is a possibility to get uh, longer uh, so to measure longer and then uh, estimate this diffusion coefficient uh, more precise now let me switch to the uh, antibody so here uh, uh, we measured the NIST uh, antibody um, samples uh, in buffer acetic acid with the pH 5 in acetate buffer so here we were you can see the spectrum of uh, the uh, monoclonal antibody in acetate buffer uh, here we were actually surprised uh, that we see this acetate buffer so that's a small signal that comes from the acetate so that means that uh, our method uh, is quite sensitive and spectrometer is quite sensitive to see the uh, small amount of the um, acetate uh, molecules in the in such systems yeah but uh, the most interesting signal for us were these rose and green so here we integrated our spectra just to see the dynamics of the uh, MAB uh, in solution here I present the data for different concentrations and at, at 25 degrees so actually we measured in a temperature from 10 to 35 degrees um, and in this concentration range uh, the uh, diffusion time was 20 milliseconds uh, it was uh, limited uh, by t2 relaxation time uh, yeah if you have a question regarding this I will I can answer later so uh, we as we can see that the, uh, actually we have only one diffusion component so we can measure cell diffusion and we can plot, plot this with um, uh, a function of uh, concentration temperature and so on so uh, here uh, I compare the data uh, for NSA uh, measured at short times uh, actually it's not very uh, straightforward uh, to get this diffusion coefficient uh, that is actually hid, uh, hidden here in the formula so but uh, actually if you analyze this data of NSA and you apply uh, um, the uh, the models for translational diffusion rotational and slow domain motion and then you can extract this uh, short time uh, diffusion coefficient and compare this with PFG NMR that is actually a green line and the uh, red line here as far as I know yeah so for different uh, concentra uh, for different concentration and actually uh, the diffusion uh, is very nicely comparable so what you get from um, PFG NMR and uh, from NSA and also from DLS. So uh, everything is in agreement. It's about four, ten, four um, angstrom square per nanoseconds. Um, yeah, but now uh, about the PFG NMR data uh, measured at different concentrations that you can see on the left, left side. The data they were already corrected to the vis water viscosity that means that uh, they are not dependent on the um, diffusion of the water that's only um interaction effect let's say like this <clears throat> um what we can see we see that the we have a constant uh, cell diffusion coefficient for lower concentrations and uh, when concentration reaches 50 milligram per milliliter uh, we uh, observe already the faster motion uh, uh, for higher temperatures yeah so the same uh, we see for even more concentrations uh, even higher concentrations the effect is, is reversible and uh, reproducible so for the 50 milligrams so we measure uh, in one direction on the temperature and in the other direction so and we got relatively um, well reproducible data and now the question is whether it relates to the stru structural or conformational change of the uh, um, monoclonal antibody um, whether it changed the conformation that uh, diffusion becomes faster uh, from SACS we see no indication uh, that um, 
uh, conformation uh, changes. Um, here, the data for the different concentrations are presented. And if you um, normalize it to the zero concentration and then uh, just uh, yeah, the normalize to the form factor, you get the nice structure factor that actually um, uh, makes the problems, uh, uh, makes difficult to prove uh, whether we have a change change of uh, hydrodynamic radius to the temperature. So, but uh, with DLS, uh, we get a similar effect. So that means that uh, diffusion um, kind of increases, diffusion coefficient increases with the temperature. And uh, the question, uh, the, uh, it, seem, it seems to be really um, related to the interactions between the protein molecules. Uh, and then, um, yeah, so we can just compare um, this conclusion, whether it takes place for the other proteins. And indeed, so the effect of the non arrhenius behavior, uh, in, of the effect of increased interparticle, interparticle interactions uh, was also shown by uh, NMR, so that 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 was measured uh, for BSA and lactalbum, um, no, um, lidocin for uh, different concentrations and different temperatures. And here uh, we see that the, for BSA, that is actually globular protein, uh, nothing happens uh, with the with the temperature, but for lidocin. Um, uh, the, there is a some deviation with the temperature. So here the data are not normalized to the water viscosity, uh, but uh, the estimated diffu uh, estimated uh, activation energy uh, for this region so uh, results in additional contribution to the activation energy. So that becomes kind of higher than just diffusion uh, in water. Activation, diffusion, uh, activation energy for the diffusion in water. And the authors, they are also uh, telling about non arrhenius behavior, and non arrhenius behavior is explained by increased interparticle interaction. Conclusion here. Uh, so we measure the cell diffusion of a monoclonal antibody in acetate buffer versus temperature and concentrations. Uh, we spend more uh, about uh, 16 hours per one temperature sample and concentration. Uh, we um, uh, normalized, so at uh, lower concentrations, uh, cell diffusion is determined by water viscosity. Uh, we see actually, if you normalize this, we see the just a straight line. And for the higher concentration, so it uh, still depends on the temperature. Um, we address uh, this effect to the interparticle interaction changes at high concentration with the temperature. So it's effect, uh, a similar effect uh, we find uh, with uh, DLS. So now is a last example. I don't know whether I have time or I don't have time. So, but very fast. Um, a few words about the alternating amphiphilic polymers. Um, so that was actually a very interesting example. Uh, we call this kinetics. Here we took the uh, alternating amphiphilic polymers. So in the phase um, where they are presented as a free polymers. So we didn't consider all other phases here. Um, and uh, we measured translocation of these polymers through the lipid membranes. For this, we use a quite interesting technique uh, that we call time resolved pulse cell gradient NMR, or better, uh, I would call this kinetic measurements. So, if you measure a polymer uh, diffusion here, um, if you are fixed on the polymer, uh, you uh, see the free polymer content and uh, you can see the encapsulated polymer content. You actually see the, if you see it on the peak of the polymer, the, the, yeah. so here you can see the um, structure of our system. Uh, here you can see the uh, lipid, so that's related to the 
Mitzel. And uh, here you can see the peak that is attributed to the polymer. So we always uh, were addressing the peak uh, that is, relate, is related to the polymer. And the uh, polymer can be actually in two phases, as a free polymer and as attached to the liposome or mitzel, and uh, then becomes slower. So as you can see, uh, if you uh, sit on this, uh, uh, in this point, so actually we can see that the uh, that this component is saturated if more polymer is accumulated in the layer of this matter. So uh, doing so, so you can investigate uh, different polymers, uh, different liposomes, different composition of your uh, bilayer. And with this, you can uh, get kind of saturation curves. Here you start uh, with zero time and you see that the time can be increased by 30 hours. You are just measuring in one point and you can see as your signal just saturates. Uh, then modifying these curves to this. So you can see that the, uh, clearly see that it's a two phase process. So that we realized uh, after quite some time looking at the curves and uh, looking for the models. And here uh, it turned out that you can really um, observe this two step uh, saturation process. First, the polymer goes to the layer and then it just uh, slowly release to the inside. So uh, model has uh, three parameters, only three. It's a translocation rate, adsorption, desorption, and you can also analyze the polymer concentration in the membrane. With this, you can measuring with the temperature, for example, you can get the activation energy for both translocation steps. So that we do actually. So I will not dwell on the details uh, because this you can just uh, yeah, so read in this paper. Um, here, we the most important is that uh, desorption, uh, adsorption is a molecular weight dependent adsorption of the, of the polymers. But desorption is not molecular weight dependence and really very, very slow. Uh, no. Yes. So adsorption is uh, very fast and desorption is very slow. Yeah. So in addition, uh, we can observe that uh, uh, amount of the polymer uh, that are uh, attached to the, to the liposome is a quite high. So that's normalized value, uh, normalized to the value of the, uh, to the amount of the polymer in the solution. So, yeah. Also with the uh, uh, translocation event, uh, we could just prove with the fluorescent spectroscopy, uh, fluorescent microscopy, uh, here you can see that we labeled our polymer with a fluorescent label, and we just uh, observed uh, uh, in the microscope uh, these vesicles, so that's giant vesicles, and we could see uh, that uh, the translocation process really happens. Uh, the only um, uh, disadvantage of the fluorescent microscopy, you wouldn't get uh, such uh, details of this translocation process, uh, like you would get with this kinetic uh, measure with PFGNR. So here, uh, just a short uh, conclusion. So we found that the polymers really translocate um, by two-step uh, two processes, and we were uh, able to investigate the detail of these processes uh, that was um, also measured as a function of length of the chain, polymer chain, and also uh, as a function of composition of this uh, um, uh, hydrophobic, hydrophilic part of the polymer. We also were able to find that diffusion is passive and polymer solubilizes in the membrane. Therefore, the desorption time uh, is very long. So summary of my talk, I think uh, I was able to show you that the PFGNMR is a quite useful, non-destructive method to explore molecular dynamics. 
uh, it measures the diffusion on the millisecond uh, micrometer uh, time and length scale, and it's uh, fully complementary to the scheduling method. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to acknowledge my co uh, colleagues, uh, Dieter Richter, Ralf Bill, um, Andreas, uh, Stefan Förster, and Jürgen Alga, and also uh, the um, PhD students uh, whose work uh, was, was involved. And I just presented this here Igor Graf von Vertab, uh, Ekaterina Bavala, and Ekaterina Kasturino. Thank you very much. <laughs>